What an honor it is to stand before you and bring God's word. Um, Marty and I were uh, asked to help out on Friday afternoon and uh, by pastor, and uh, for about an hour and a half, there was no response. <laughs> we're trying to think, well, who's going to say yes first? You know, get me off the hook. So, uh, so anyhow, um, about that time, Pastor Bob called and said, hey, I want to make sure you got the text. Yeah, I got the text. I'm praying, you know. <laughs> that's, you know, that's how you get out of this tight spot. I'm praying about it. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> God, not me, not me. <laughs> so about that time, Marty called. So I said, hey, Marty's calling. I got to talk to him. So we began to talk, and he was trying to talk me into it. Hey, you got something, man, just, you know. <laughs> Just bring it, just bring it. I'm fine, I'm fine, you know. And uh, I go, hmm, how do I get out of this one? So, uh, no, you know, I mean, that just out of fear is what it was. I, God, I love the opportunity to bring God's word. I mean, how can you lose? You know, you can mess up, but as long as you're bringing the word, it's going to do the work. And so anyhow... Marty said, hey, why don't we split this thing? Let's just do it together. Man, and that just settled in me, and I'm so excited to be here before you, and I know Marty is, so that's what's going to happen. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, going to cut and run, <laughs> and you guys get to go home. No, after me, Marty's coming up, so don't leave. <laughs> don't leave. Stay here. So, All right. Praise. Wow, praise. Thanks. God, for our worship teams, right? Man, just beautiful this morning. Where you are, no heart is left unchanged. And that's going to be part of my message, you know. That's how God works. For how great thou art, the name above all names, worthy of all praise, you know. You know, I always wish I could sing. And uh, I found out there's one place that I can sing. And you guys might be able to relate to this. It's in the shower. There's something about a shower, man, that makes you one of the best. And man, you had to hear me sing in the shower. So I thought, well, one day I'm going to bring a shower up here, right? And stand in it so I can worship with these guys, you know? <laughs> so don't be surprised. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> let's stand. We're going to pray. And uh, I want to share Psalm 100, verse 4, which actually was one of my wife's favorite, favorite verses. Uh, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So let's just take a few minutes and if you want to speak it out loud or whatever you want to do, raise your hands. Let's just praise his name, you know, for he is wonderful. He's a counselor. He's a mighty God. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. So let's just take a minute or so and Praise the Lord, just wherever, you know, your heart takes you and, and speak it out if you can. So, Father, we're just grateful to you. Praise your holy name, Lord. No God like you, God. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are worthy of our praise, Father. God, it's so good. It's so good to lift your name on high. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Father. Okay, so, you know, the um, reason Marty and I are here, obviously, and I think most of the church knows that Bob and Terry, um, you know, got COVID, and so no problem. We've got... Oh, yeah, sit down. <laughs> Good lead. You might, some of them might be standing up the whole service. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, um, you know, Bob and Terry got COVID, and they had the grandkids, and, and uh, so well, no problem. You know, we have Pastor Tony. He can take care of that one. Well, Friday afternoon, he tested, and he was positive. And so, well, that's not going to work, you know, so... Uh, so anyhow, I just want to pray for them, and then we'll take a minute or so, and I'm sure you all have someone that needs prayer, whether it's uh, um, for COVID or sickness or family situations, broken hearts, whatever it may be, 
You know, uh, we had the privilege before Christmas, Marty and I and the rest of the elders, to go meet a man that I never had met before. He comes here, he and his wife, and uh, his name is Paul. And, man, we went over to his house, and, uh, and so we had a little chit-chat. Not very long, and he said, you know, I just read where it says that if anyone's sick, to call for the elders of the church and pray that they might be healed. And so he said, That's, aren't we supposed to do that? That's what I want to do. And it was so awesome. It was so awesome. So we prayed for him. His wife, Roberta, was there. What a sweetheart. And then his son, Mark, came. And so we all prayed together, and it, and it was beautiful. And so he had found out after that. He knew he had something going on. He found out after that that he had a... Uh, um, What's it called? Marty's what Marty had. Yeah, lymphoma. So, so, and after that, he found out it was the rapid moving kind, which, you know, go, oh my goodness, but no, praise God, because if it's rapid moving, I found this out with my sister, Renee, if it's rapid moving, the medicine will attack it quick, and they do battle. So anyhow, he's doing quite well, and, um, First uh, round of chemo, he uh, had some nausea and wasn't feeling too good. And after that, all that went away. And so he's starting this week his third round. So we're going to pray for him. And, uh, and then when he gets recovered and come back, uh, you'll be able to meet him, he and his wonderful wife, Roberta. So, Father, we're just honored that we can come before you. And, Father, that you would listen to us. My goodness, hallelujah, we thank you, Lord. And Father, we, we pray for Paul, and thank you that the nausea has gone. And Father, thank you that, as he reported, um, that this lymphoma uh, is shrinking, Father. And uh, God, we just ask that you would give his body strength as he goes through um, this third uh, treatment. So, uh, Lord, bless his wife. Help her to be who you called her to be in the midst of that, to um, care for her husband and, and his son, Mark, and Father Mark's siblings, and, and Father Paul's siblings, his brothers, that uh, through all of this, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Father, that's what you do. You, know, you take our mess and make a message out of it. We thank you for that. And God, we lift up our pastor and his wife, Terry, and those precious grandsons. And Father, that you would completely heal them. We thank you that they're all doing better. And uh, Father, just uh, continue to bring them back to health. And Father, uh, you know, for Tony and his family and talking with Luis before the service here. They're doing fine, and we want to give you thanks for that. So restore Tony uh, back to health, and we thank you that he didn't have a real tough struggle with this stuff. So, uh, and Nancy, Father, Nancy Cook, um, we thank you that she is moving along in her recovery, and I saw Craig this morning. It was good to see him, Father. So just bless these families, and uh, and we thank you again that you hear us when we pray and you answer. So, uh, church, why don't you just take a minute or so? And uh, you all know, like I said, someone who are in these situations. Just take a minute or so and, and um, pray and then we'll get uh, on with the message. Okay, so today I want to briefly share with you um, what it should look like when we consecrate our lives to Jesus. And 
as God always does, you know, he prepares you ahead of time when you do things like this. And uh, so this morning while I was getting ready, I always listen to music. I have some of my favorite oldies stuff, you know, that really shows my age. But I really like, I really like a lot of that. And then, of course, a lot of uh, Christian music. And so this morning as I was getting ready, this song by... Uh, Tim McGraw came on and uh, I just want to read a little bit of the lyrics and how beautiful uh, this is and how it really fits into uh, the message this morning so um, it says oh it's a beautiful thing don't think I can keep it all in I just gotta let you know what it is that won't let me go it's your love it just does something to me. It sends a shock right through me. I can't get enough. And if you wonder about the spell I'm under, oh, it's your love. Better than I was, more than I am. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> and all of this happened by taking your hand. And who I am now is who I wanted to be. And now that we're together, I'm stronger than ever. I'm happy and free. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. Don't think I can keep it all in. And if you ask me why I've changed, all I got to do is say your sweet name, the name of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You know, I'm convinced that Tim McGraw or anybody that composes music would not be able to do it like this if it wasn't for the love of God, whether they know Jesus or not. I mean, this crazy guy had a, had a little Bible study going in a previous church, about 12 guys, 10 guys, 15 guys, depending. And you know what we did for three weeks straight? We worshiped with secular singers. I think there was a few Christians in the group, but I mean, hey, Elvis, Man, he, he got right down with it. Uh, Joe Cocker, you know, that guy that spaz, you know. Uh, yeah. And by the way, these guys didn't have to sing in the shower. Man, they were good. So, um, oh, and Barry McGuire. And you, there were several of them. And we did that for three weeks. And I thought, man, I better stop this or this thing's going to be shut down quickly. And, uh, but we got, you know, I think there's a point to it that... Without the love of God, these people wouldn't be able to talk about it, right? And without the love of God, neither could we, right? So I'm going to speak to that a little bit. Uh, so yesterday was a celebration at, at my house, and we, we celebrated two grandsons' birthdays, Landon, who turned 10, and Braylon, who turned 9, whose dad is uh, here today, my son Jake, um, he had to come so I could get up on the platform, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so uh, then we watched 49ers game. More celebrating, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, but, but it's not about the 49ers and birthdays. And as I look back on it, I thought, wow, what if a new neighbor knocked on the door to introduce himself and I invited him in? He would immediately know something about us that we have two grandsons who had birthdays and that we are 49er fans by looking at the birthday balloons with a 49ers logo. And all of this, whether they knew anything about the 49ers or not, they would know that. So, wow. <laughs> if that same scenario would happen without the birthday and the game, would they know that we love Jesus? If you invited, if I invited this new neighbor in, would this neighbor know that our house, we love Jesus? Good question. In Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, uh, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Remember, I think it was a woman at the well got into the discussion with Jesus, and she talked about where to worship God. And so Jesus said, well, a time is coming, 
you know, you'll neither worship here or in this mountain, you know, for God seeks those who worship him in spirit and truth, you know, spiritual worship. And then it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So be changed by the way you think. God makes us anew. He gives us new thinking. And sometimes that, ooh, sounds like new age, you know. New age think they invented it. No, God did, right? He said, look, I'm going to change who you are. I'm going to change the way you think. Because there is a way to think when you know him and walk with him. And then it goes on that by the testing, uh, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so, you know, as I begin to put this message together, I always keep notes on things I hear. I cut them and paste them, you know, from other pastors or speakers or what have you. And uh, I came across, I had this title, Consecration, and it was by John Piper. Now, if you don't know anything about John Piper, he was born uh, uh, actually January 11th in 1946. He's a theologian, pastor, and chancellor of Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis. Uh, he taught biblical studies at Bethel University for six years before serving as pastor for preaching and vision of Bethlehem Baptist Church for 33 years. Uh, and I really like to listen to him and read what he has to say because he breaks it down into my language that I can handle. And for most of us, he really does. He has this gift of breaking down the word that we can understand it and take it in. So, you know, I'm going to quote from him. I mean, I, instead of trying to change a few words, I'm not plagiarizing. I said, hey, I'm just going to say what he says because he says it so beautifully. So here's Piper. Now, this is before COVID, mind you. This is before that. So here's what he says. The days we are living in between his first and second coming are now not meant for our delusion, disillusionment, but are ordained for a harvest of souls for the bride of Christ to become pure and spotless. That's you and me, church. That's you and me. This delay is intended. It's not a mistake. It has intentions. This delay is intended to create a desperate groan, an ache, a longing, and a desire for him throughout the earth. Piper puts it like this. The bridegroom left on a journey just before the wedding. And the bride cannot act as if things are normal. If she loses him, she'll ache for his return. So are we aching for his return? Is there an ache in our heart for the return of Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit confronts us with the indwelling presence of Jesus Christ why simultaneously spawning a yearning for the fullness of finally seeing him face to face. And this yearning does not originate in us, but is planted there by the Holy Spirit. Can we give God a shout for that? Hallelujah. Amen. You know, Jesus' words were true before he sent it. Look, I'll send the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll tell you all this stuff. I'll reveal all this stuff to you. So Wayne Gruden, who is a research professor of theo theology and biblical studies at Phoenix Seminary, sums up our dilemma. To some extent, the degree to which we actually groan for Christ's return is a measure of the spiritual condition of our lives right now. Woo, that's a mouthful. So the Bible tells us periodically, test your faith. Test your faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? 
that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not realize that, church, that Jesus Christ is in you? Man, that, boy, there's all kinds of reasons for shouts of joy there. So what should we be looking for? Are we striving or are we resting? Are we anxious or are we grateful? Are we groaning for his return or just hanging around hoping we're in? Are we preaching the gospel or letting someone else handle it? What is my spiritual condition? Am I groaning for the return of Christ? Piper again says, look at the gift of the groan is not given to make our lives more difficult. The gift of the groan keeps our hearts awake when they are inclined to sleep. Anybody go there? I mean, you want to just worship God, the next thing you know, you're snoring, you know. The inner groan keeps our hearts in love for God. It keeps us hungry to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians 3.10. The gift of the groan keeps us reaching for eternity so that we might live free of the deception of the lust of this age and the comforts of the temporary. Will you receive the gift of the groom today? Just ponder that in your heart as you hear the rest of this message. So the, the Bible says that God put eternity in our hearts. My problem is that I'm trying to fill it up with other things of the world. You know, pride, my being good, hey, look at my stuff, my obedience, hiding my sin when God said he desires honesty in our inward most being. You know, lots of stuff. Uh, T.D. Jake says that when we stand at the altar or walk the aisle to be married, what we don't see is the line of suitcases that we're pulling behind us. Our stuff, our aunties, our cousins, our siblings, our believing that the way we grew up is the only way. You know, our job, the best food in the world that, that my spouse is going to love. You know, the best way to vacation, the list goes on and on. So what's in your suitcase? You know, what's in your wallet? No, but what's in your suitcase, right? <laughs> Again, Piper. The new type of fasting he was unveiling is built upon the mystery that the bridegroom has come and that he will come again. Hallelujah. Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. There's that thinking, right? We have a new way of thinking. He made us anew. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And then... <laughs> He says this. Now, I tell you, this is someone who is very confident in his faith with Christ Jesus and knowing that that's what Christ wants to give us. Listen to this. This, uh, this is something. Paul got a little bragging here, but he can, right? Brothers, join in imitating me. Oh, my goodness. Anybody want to, hey, yeah, watch what I do. Well, Hopefully, you know, we're getting out. I'm, I'm not trying to guilt you, but that's where we should be. Look at, you see me, you see the Father. Jesus said, you see me, you've seen him. And then that's our job, right? Okay, so uh, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Amen? And by the power that enables him even to, to, to subject all things to himself. And that's including you and I. You and I. So here's some questions that Piper threw out. 
Am I preparing and consecrating myself for the wedding day? Do I realize that the present day call to consecration is directly connected to our future presentation before our bridegroom king? Will I be offended because I know because I only know Jesus as the lamb and do not see him as the lion. Do I have an issue with his end time judgments? Remember, the power of our consecration will ultimately be revealed in our revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. John 17, 1, 3 is one of uh, one of my favorite verses. So this is Jesus speaking to the Father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Wow, pretty simple, right? I mean, there's no gymnastics there. Just believe, he said. Just believe. What does King Solomon have to say about his bride? <clears throat> Song of Solomon's, uh, chapter 4, verse 9. Our bridegroom king is declaring over us, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes. God's just asking for one glance of her eyes. Just look up to him. One glance. That's all he asks of us. You know, there's the condition, right? It's free, but there's a condition. One glance. Look up. Look into his eyes. And, you know, they've written a song about it. And uh, it goes like this. And I remember there's some program on TV years ago. And they had this guy on and he played the, I don't know, the guitar or something. And so he'd say a few things, and they wrote a song about it. And then he played the song. I just, I remember that. It was, just, it was a riot. The guy was funny as heck. But this is, this is powerful. This song, and you, I'm sure you've all heard it. Set your eyes upon Jesus and look into his wonderful face. And the things of the world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You've probably all heard that. That's so true. One glance, one glance. Oh, my goodness. So are we ravishing our bridegroom uh, return? He is returning, you know. The Bible says that the bride has made herself ready. So what might that look like in us, you know? Well, the Galileans were kind of looked down upon by the Jews, you know. They're a little bit sloppy and a little bit other than, you know, like you and me, or like me, I guess I'll speak for myself. But anyhow, in their wedding ceremony, uh, they talk. Part of their ceremony deals with how the bride makes herself ready. So the young man has come and professed his love, and they drink the cup, and everything is good. So he goes back to the house to make things ready for his bride. Right? So what is she doing in the meantime? Well, she's fully clothed, and along with her attendants, their lamps are trimmed and full of oil in expectation of the groom's return. You might say that they slept with one eye open in glorious expectation. I mean, they were prepared, and that's an example for you and I. You know, in John 14, 1 through 4, let, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If we're not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may also be. Just glorious. You see, the bridegroom has come and has asked for our hand. He's now preparing a place and is returning to get us. What a love story. 
You know, something beyond what we could even imagine or think or dream up, right? So very simply put, this is um, Piper again, I think. Very simply put, the harlot bride loves the world and enjoys friendship with it. The consecrated bride is in love with the bridegroom and develops special friendship with the Holy Spirit. The worst ab- ab- attribute of the harlot bride will be her pride. The harlot bride will glory in her perversion and idolatry. She will mock the consecrated bride and persecute those who walk in humility and meekness. Revelation 18.7 says of her that to the degree she glorified herself, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. Oh my goodness, not pretty. Piper again says, they will be oracles of righteousness, friends of the bridegroom, gripped by repentance and fear the Lord, prophets who despise and weep over wickedness and sin. They are forerunners, deliverers, and faithful to the truth, no matter what it costs them. Their convictions are fierce. Their consecration is intense. Everyone else wants to tone them down and moderate their crying out. See, that's why the prophets were not popular. So we might ask ourselves, do we cringe when we hear their convictions? When you meet somebody that's all in for Jesus, do you kind of, woo, I don't know about that. So what does that do in our heart? Who's that person in your life that makes you feel uneasy when you see and hear the convictions of their heart towards the things of God? Do you wish to be like them or do you try to dodge them when you see them coming? Are we yearning for one glance of our bridegroom's eyes or to give him one glance from our eyes? Are we yearning for that, church? To some extent, the, the degree to which we actually groan for Christ's return is a measure of the spiritual condition of our lives right now. I want to deliberately encourage this mighty groan for Jesus. That's a quote from A.W. Tozer. The const the creative bride will choose to abstain from many pleasures that the world offers in pursuit of a higher pleasure, the presence and the person of the bridegroom king who's coming back, who's returning for his bride. Again, Piper says, they are functioning to prepare the bride to meet the bridegroom. They've been branded by the reality of the pure and spotless bride. They are called to be a consecrated bride. They will be confrontational and appear harsh and radical in the eyes of the casual Christian. But they will be mighty end-time oracles in the hands of Almighty God. They groan for the glory of God to be fully manifested in the bride. And they understand that this can never happen until wickedness and sin is confronted. Let these friends of the bridegroom arise. Oh, how we desperately need them in these days. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city, outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Revelations 22, verses 14 and 15. So a good friend of pastors and a lot of us who know him, Pastor Harris, uh, when he was praying over Bob and Terry, uh, he said that he saw the bride, our church. You notice in the previous uh, verse or uh, quote from Piper that he talked a lot about the bride. So you know why... God put on Pastor Bob's heart that this church will be the bride because that's who we are, you and I. And that's what every other church don't know. They just don't have the right name. They haven't figured it out. No, they've figured it out. But what a name. What a name. What a blessing, you know. So um, I heard Pastor Harris pray over Bob and Terry. And he said he saw the bride as being pioneers and forerunners. 
that they would be sitting on the altar watching the young and their families come in and soak up the word of God, hungering and seeking intimacy with the bridegroom and to pass that truth on to future generations. And I I believe that's true of our church. I believe we see it, we've witnessed it. So the Holy Spirit confronts us with the indwelling presence of Jesus Christ while simultaneously spawning a yearning for the fullness of finally seeing him face to face. So the Nazarites, who were very devoted in those days to Christ, they shaved their head. They did a lot of things, no wine. I mean, they were really straight shooters, you know, in love with Jesus. So uh, the Nazarites, who are not living in intimacy with the Lord, also face the danger of self-righteousness when they rejoice in their commitment to Jesus. Now listen to this. When they rejoice into their commitment to Jesus and not in Jesus himself. Boy, ponder that in your hearts. You know, we can be all a body yet not know him. And when, and when Jesus gives an example of the end times, he told the goats, get over here, man. Get to my left. And they go, why? You know, because I never knew you. I never knew you. He wants to be known, right? Whoa. I mean, that, that's... Uh, In fact, you might call that a heat check. When an NBA player takes a shot well behind the three-point line, or well beyond uh, the three-point line, they call that a heat check. (laughs) Heat check. Are we glorifying in our commitment to Jesus instead of Jesus himself? What's the difference? Are we striving to be obedient in a pursuit of intimacy with our bridegroom? As if it depends on man who wills or runs? Or are we receiving it as a free gift to God, like the Bible says? You know, it's a big difference, and a big difference in the outcome, church. So the gift of the groan is not given to make our lives more difficult. The gift of the groan keeps our hearts awake when they're inclined to sleep. The inner groan keeps our hearts in love for God. It keeps us hungry to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And the gift of the ground keeps us reaching for eternity that we might live free of deception of the lust of this age and the comforts of the temporary. And will you receive the gift of the ground today? Now, church, we've gone through a month of prayer and fasting. And uh, (coughs) Piper says, without a lifestyle of fasting, We cannot cultivate the kind of hunger and extravagant desire for Jesus that he's so worthy of. If we do not feel strong desires for more of God, Piper points out, it is not because we've experienced him and are deeply satisfied. It is because we have worshipped the gifts he has given us for so long. We have stuffed ourselves with small pains and have no real appetite for God things. So a new kind of fasting is a powerful weapon in the consecrated bride's arsenal to keep her hungry, aching, longing, and lovesick for her bridegroom king. Many Christians hear the invitation to go deeper into God, to consecrate themselves further, to separate the things of this world, and many of them can't, just can't seem to get there. Why? I believe it's simply because they don't have have a revelation of who has invited them to the table of encounter. You know, that Jesus Christ is prepared at the table for those who love him. King David testified of the power of spending time in God's presence as he wrote and said of the Lord, You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 1. So do we believe like King David believed? My prayer is that during this time of fasting, you have a deeper groaning intimacy um, with our bridegroom. You have ravished my heart, my sister, 
my bride, you have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes. Amen. So Marty's going to come up and conclude uh, today with some more rich teaching. Marty and I are uh, elders, but we're also brothers in the Lord. God has done a few amazing things between the two of us in his presence. And so I just love this guy. And he loves the Lord, and he knows the Word, and he knows church history. So if you've got a question, he's a Bible answer man here. Okay? Remember that. All right. Clearly, Arnold and I are the technology pastors. <laughs> so, um, maybe from this adventure we're doing this morning, you get this, that you see a reflection of what the elder board is like at the bride church. If you, ha- are, if you find yourself in chaos and you have not experienced sitting down with Arnold at any time and talking with him, he will bring peace to your chaos. And he does so on the board. And so if Arnold is the peace bringer, I'm the disruptor. (laughs) And you think, well, how's that like Jesus? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit, okay? Uh, Because Pastor Bob's been in Mark, and we're going to be in Mark 7, so if you put Mark 7... Up there, 20 and 23, uh, Pastor Bob's been talking about uh, bringing the hard word. Hi, Mary. Hi. <laughs> uh, and so uh, he uh, said, bring the hard word. Well, you got to learn how to bring it, right? Jesus knew how to bring it, and he brought a lot of hard words. That image we get of uh, p- those paintings you see of Jesus sitting in the fields and the little lambs jumping over the top of him with all the little children, well, that's a nice little image. But ask a Pharisee if that's what they saw, right? So, Mark chapter 7. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So we hear a lot, lots and lots about heart language in our culture, don't we? Heart language. Follow your heart through tough situations. Trust your heart. Go to the heart of the matter. You broke his or her heart. She has an evil heart. Oh, he has a good heart. Heart language. I don't think that I'm telling you anything new, beloved, about your relationship or yourself here. The heart of the problem, Os Guinness said, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And Jesus knew it. And we should too. Our Mark passage is coming off of Jesus uh, repudiating the Jesus leader, uh, the Jewish leaders, and he said to them, What did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with my lips, but your heart is far from me. So uh, three points in this brief time, three points I'm going to cover. The condition of the heart, the nature of the heart, and the operation of the heart. So what what is the heart in Scripture? Well, keep in mind that these are wor- these words we talk about are intangible in regards to location. It's not here. Words like soul, spirit, are words that are often utilized to describe uh, the makeup of a uh, person. Words like heart, mind, thoughts, conscience, volition, emotions, intellect, desires, character, can direct you to specific conditions of a person and certain outcomes. They also are interchangeably in in your uh, Bible translations, aren't they? See them changing all over the place. But though they are intangible functions, you can impart, see, touch, feel, sense, know, judge, and respond to these descriptive words, can't you? Because they are intrinsically more than just words. We use them all the time. It's always best to proceed, isn't it, and let the text provide the framework when using what I call these soul words. 
right? Because if you want to get intimate with somebody and close to somebody, you're going to use these kinds of words, aren't you? Soul words. Maybe the best definition of the heart is the center, the center of all thinking, willing, feeling, and moral life, and moral life, and moral life. So the heart is the central seat of man's conscience. We all have one. Life in its moral, intellectual, volitional, making choices, emotional aspects. All of these intangibles, along with the spirit, the breath of life, make up what the scripture defines as the soul. We all have one of those, too. They are found in a normal child as they grow up, aren't they? But you, uh, but you would not find the word brain in the Bible. However, the Bible refers to the heart when referring to thinking. Hebrews chapter 4 says, discerning the thoughts and tents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 8 says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. We know the heart is where emotions are, are described as coming from. The will or choice comes from the heart based upon personal desires. And we got a lot of those. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 17, he says, You become obedient, you become obedient from the heart. From the heart. Finally, every person has been given a moral conscience that regulates God's standards, his laws. And every man violates those standards that were inserted to help guide the heart. Every one of us. We have that all in common. So though we may refer to the heart as heart functions, we break them into pieces. Our whole person operates interactively, doesn't it? See, all of us are image bearers. Non-believers are image bearers. And they can obey God's law. We all execute, every human being executes moral good and moral bad. See, in God's creation, he, disrupt, he distributes common grace for everybody. This grace can be exercised by anyone through obedience to a moral conscience. That's why non-believers do good things. That's why we should. But everything about us is tainted. Everything. C.S. Lewis observes in a rather humorous remark, he says, He that but looketh on a plate of ham and eggs to lust after it hath already committed breakfast within it in his heart. <laughs> I think he got it. All right. The more I choose to engage in my heart's desires for lust, the more lust feels, uh, feeds upon me. True. A society with good laws thrives, and a lawless society suffers. Look at our cities right now. No laws. With enough effort, you can do the law. With enough sin, you can undo some of the benefits of the gospel and grace. How many times have you have said, I, I will just do it this time and get it out of my system? It's a streaming video that never ends. Thus, the Bible is realistic in its evaluation of the human heart. It recognizes the good, from, uh, the good from creation and the grace of God, but it is utterly, utterly straightforward about sin and folly bound up within us. This is our condition. Second point, the nature of the heart. So if you put Ecclesiastes 9 up there, please. This is the nature. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. This is the unfortunate thing about everything that happens on earth, beloved. The, the same fate awaits everyone. The hearts of the people are full of evil and there is madness in their hearts during their lives. Tell me that's not true at times. Then we die. 
The scripture describes our hearts as being made of stone or as being changed to flesh. Spurgeon said it this way, that a heart of flesh is one that bleeds when God sticks an arrow in it. It is a heart that can yield when the gospel penetrates, a heart that can be impressed when it is sealed by God's word, a heart that warms, thinks, aspires, and loves. It is a new heart with the right spirit which has been regenerated. Born again. Notice that the Bible has commands for a person to change their heart. God says, change your heart. Change your own heart. Stone to flesh. But also, God will change. It also says God will change your heart. This is not uh, New Testament only, but it's found in the Old Testament as well. The commands of God are unyielding. They never change. Love the Lord your God with all your heart is a command and a command to every human being, not just believers. Uh So, without a doubt, this heart change conveys a change in character. Supposed to. But before the character shows up, there's something that lies deeper. Before the actual mental events occur, thoughts and emotions, intentions, etc., right? There is a newer disposition, a nature coming about. A new disposition is a different spirit, a new nature, a new approach to life, a new approach to life. I have been given new life, a new chance, a new opportunity, a new outlook. I walk in a new realm, a realm I see far differently than the old realm that I don't walk in anymore. This walk produces different desires which begin to produce more positive character traits. Good things and not evil things begin to emanate from my behavior. It's a slow process in me. The fruit of the Spirit is what you start seeing. Love, joy, all that. And people will notice. People will say, you're different. You're a disciple of something. Who? Someone. These new behaviors look a bit like habits, but we also order our desires, don't we, into some level of importance. We put first things first. We put the kingdom of God first. We start changing the way we live. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasure would mean what you most fundamentally desire. What you most fundamentally desire, and you're going to go after it. So I look for patterns of thoughts, concerns, desires, behaviors, to identify where a person's treasure is. Beloved, especially my own. Every day. Every day. So so, uh, if you read The Magician's uh, Nephew in the Chronicles of Narnia, if you read that book, there was a character named Uncle Andrew. And he had quite the famous quote, which actually was a Lewis quote. He said it this way, For what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. What you see and hear depends a great deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. What sort of person you are will reflect the world we're looking at. So who gets the credit for this change in nature? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, if you'll put that up, 28 through 29. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, not by the moral code. His praise is not from man, but from God. So circumcision is a mark. It's an impression. It's a character change. So this idea seems to be that a person is a spiritual Jew, If he has a certain character, if he characteristically thinks in certain ways, has certain uh, desires, certain things, feels certain feelings, 
and behaves in certain ways from the heart. When his heart is then attuned to the ways of God, sees everything the way God sees it, he lives by the Spirit and is a real Jew. Think about that. It is not found by attempting to live in a moral code, but comes through the Spirit. So all this shows us that through the working of the Spirit, the heart can be taught morally. Though word and, through word and spirit, the heart knows good from evil, light from darkness, and is a force that can choose to do otherwise. We can choose not to, or we can choose to. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said. And Paul says, having the eyes of our heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope which he has called you, Ephesians 1. That's the nature. Now the operation, finally, the operation. So you see, we see that the heart has been changed and is changeable. The New Testament is clear that hearts can degenerate morally and they also can improve. Listen to the metaphors when the Bible describes the heart as darkened, seared, lost, hard or hardened. You, can leave, you, you cannot leave an impression on stone. Listen to the uh, metaphors when the Bible describes the heart as shaped, open, directed, translucent, and impressionable. Wet clay, and we are clay, being molded can be molded into something brand new. So we know that sometimes the Bible says that God hardens hearts. And sometimes people are said to harden their own hearts against him. Someone who refuses to listen contributes to a disposition, a nature in himself and not wanting to hear, not wanting to believe and darkens, as Romans 1 says, darkens his understanding. He becomes blind. The heart can be trained in good and evil. According to the New Testament, uh, Peter says, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. So the heart is the scene of hidden thoughts. The heart is the scene of hidden thoughts and desires and dispositions to behaviors that can be discerned through gifting. Every believer has general discernment, good from evil. You've been given that. Now, some have a special gift that really, I think pastors are discerners of hearts. They need to be. Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, boy, How'd you like to stand in front of him? You will. Because of self-deception, we call it success, successful rationalization or self-justification, right? Or lack of self-awareness stemming from our immaturity. Uh, we do not know even our own motives, but he does. So a disposition can be preset towards an event or situation, right? We're thinking ahead. We had it set up. The disposition expresses itself through its thoughts, desires, actions, intentions in healthy and unhealthy ways. The dispensational thoughts or desires that were hidden in our hearts, the Bible says, are brought to light in new situations that are credited to work the work of the Spirit word and spirit. The word and spirit will enlighten our hearts, as Paul said. So for example, when you hear the law being taught, when you hear the law, the commands coming at you, right? What reactions do you have? What goes through your head? When you read about Jesus hanging out with tax collectors in the scriptures and prostitutes, what happens to your thinking? More recent example, 
when you hear someone declare that you must get vaccinated or another declare you should not, how do you react? What do the events and great sacrifices in Jesus' life elicit in you, more importantly? Does word and spirit change people? Does word and spirit change us? The prostitute in scripture becomes bold and attends the party. The tax collector repents. Peter sees the event of the cross and sins and then becomes courageous. The Pharisees, the keepers of the law, see the same Jesus events, the same things that Jesus did that everybody else saw. And what do they become? Slanderers, liars, and even murderers. The Apostle Paul looked forward to a similar revelation of the men's hearts when Christ comes again. So put up 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light uh, the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Indeed, when even the spirit-filled worship of Christ in church, like we're doing today, by ordinary Christians may have this effect. Right? 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 25. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, and the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Isn't that marvelous? So here's the real problem with the human heart. It is a poor student of God's word. It is a poor student of God's word. It will take God's truth and it'll twist it and it'll change it and it'll rearrange it to make it fit into a box that is pleasing to you. All, of you, have, all you have to do is find you a version that reads the right way. Find you a preacher or teacher who explains it like you want to hear it or look for an interpretation that lines up with your lifestyle. And boy, we look all over the place for that. If I lean towards liberty, right, I see liberty in the scripture. If I lean towards the black and white, I lean towards legalism in the scripture. So beloved, it is always dangerous, always dangerous to uh, only trust your heart. Don't do that. The Bible tells us that it will deceive you. The only one who knows the heart is the Lord. You are better off, far off, it, to, to trust the word of God. You are better off to trust the word of God. So here's a point. Ladies, listen to this very closely. And men, you better listen to this. This comes from an American poet, a lady. I thought it was an incredible thing that she said. Uh, Maya Angelou, she said it this way, a woman's heart must be so hidden in God, a woman's heart must be so hidden in God that a man has to seek him to find her. Amen. That's powerful. Right? We are to, and we are to do this in community. That's why we come to church. What the heart conceals from the individual, and it does, it reveals to others. That's why I hang out with Arnold. He's honest with me. Jesus plainly says that it is not the things on the outside that defile us, and it is not the forms and rituals of religion that save us. It is an eternal work of God in the heart after he takes up residence through regeneration. The Pharisees thought that cleaning up the outer man would take care of the inner man. And Jesus says the opposite is true. The opposite. And finally, if after telling you all of this, 
and I ask you to just go and do likewise? Just, just be a better person, all of you. Then I would be leading you to severe failure because I'm sure you've all experienced this. I have. If I told you to just try harder and you think you can go out and do it, you would be trying to save yourself. Lots of luck, Charlie, they say. You see, on the far side of this problem with the heart, on the very far side of the problem with the heart, something we try to avoid at all cost is repentance. Repentance. You need repentance. God says in his word, I grant you repentance. He gave it to us to use. If you are willing to say, I am a sinner and deserve with my heart and deserve what, and deserve what my heart has earned me. And I look to Jesus and what he has done for me. The only one who knows my heart, the only one who will change my heart, the only one that will accurately judge my heart, then I will be taught. I will be taught to walk in the spirit by the training of his word. <coughs> the uh, musicians, and we can go ahead and pass out the communion. <clears throat> See, that's the only way, people. That is the only way. The way is narrow. The way is narrow. Look to him, rely on him, and as uh, C.S. Lewis puts it this way, so accurately, it is safe to tell the pure in heart, it is safe to tell the pure in heart that they will see God. Because, because, it is only the pure in heart that will want to. Make sense? So, if nothing else, take this message to your heart.